All right, well, hello everyone in person, um, and thank you to those online for joining today's um, RAL seminar. Um, we have Dr. Zachary Asher as our speaker today and a guest visitor here in the lab this week. Um, Zach is an assistant professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Western Michigan University. He, his research interests are focused on the real world uh, realization of energy efficient and autonomous vehicles. And today he'll talk about how um, his work intersects with uh, our interest in surface transportation weather. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Zach. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Curtis. Um, thank you for, for hosting me. It's been just lovely so far. Um, I'm going to talk about enabling energy efficient operation of autonomous vehicles in inclement weather using new technologies. But really, this is a broad overview of my entire research history. Um, so I know that most of you, all of you, are interested in the weather piece. But I would just encourage you to, to be patient. There's sort of a lead in as to how I got there and why the conclusions I found initially in my research motivate weather research, um, and then where I'm going to go from there. So, this is generally um, the agenda I'm going to follow. So starting with my background in terms of education and some of my early research experiences, um, as well as starting my lab at Western Michigan University, how that lab evolved. And then I'll go into my research, the completed projects, talk about the main overall conclusions from that research. That will allow me to transition into current projects. Um, so I'll go over those in um, whatever details I have that I can fit into the, the time here. And then I've just got like three slides in the end um, talking about future work uh, plans. All right, so uh, for my background, I'm going to just talk about my education and then starting this lab at Western. So I got my bachelor's from Colorado State in mechanical engineering, and I did about a year and a half a uh, part-time undergraduate research position testing and evaluating clean cook stoves for impoverished countries. So that was kind of my first experience with research. Um, it was a fun project, still ongoing, I believe. Um, I got my master's in 2012. I decided I wanted to explore aerospace engineering, which CSU does not offer, so I left. And uh, my thesis was on the propellantless capture and removal of space debris. That happens using tether momentum exchange. Um, after graduating with my bachelor's and while getting my master's, I also worked full time uh, starting at Excellus, which is now Harris. Um, this is a, just a large government contractor that maintains Department of Defense radar and telescopes. So I worked there for uh, four years. I worked at a small government contractor that designed military boats, this co uh, collaboration between Burdon and Namjet. But in 2015, I decided I was done working in industry. I did not like it. I didn't like having a boss and all that kind of stuff. So decided I was going to go back and get a PhD and try and, and try my hand at, at becoming a professor. So I finished my PhD in, in 2018 in mechanical engineering under Dr. Tom Bradley. And I focused on automotive engineering at this point. So specifically enabling predictive energy management in hybrid electric vehicles, which I'll talk about more in the next couple slides. I had a postdoc lined up at the University of Michigan under Dr. Kolmanovsky, but I ended up only needed to work that for a few months because I had this offer at Western Michigan University. All right, so in 2018, I'm a professor, and now I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my, with my research, with my life, right? So my first thought was, OK, well, the, the tools that I have are modeling, control, and optimization. And I've kind of applied this to the aerospace and automotive fields. So I want to focus on those fields. But in general, I think I could apply this to almost any mechanical system. So I created the Modeling Control and Optimization, or MCO lab. And I started pursuing any, any opportunity, anyone who would give me some funding to do some research. Right? And very quickly, I discovered that the state of Michigan is providing lots of opportunities for autonomous vehicle research and development. And after three years of doing this, I sort of took a step back and said, OK, where is my funding coming from? Uh, where am I successful? Where am I not successful? And I found that 70% of my funding was in autonomous vehicle research and development, despite the fact that that wasn't even a big focus of my PhD. 30% of my funding was in automotive energy efficient controls. And so I said, all right, well, this is where I'm successful. This is what's working. Why don't I just double down on this? And so I created the Energy Efficient and Autonomous Vehicles, or EVE Lab. So here's kind of what I've been up to. Um, 
at the EVE lab, so focused on applications of automotive energy and autonomy. Um, been writing a lot of proposals, and I think at this point it's exciting because I now have multi-year proposals that allow me to take a step back from just churning out another proposal every two or three months and instead focus on project execution, being more directly involved in the research. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that over the next couple of years. Currently, I have four PhD students and one master's student. Um, just here's a picture of a lab ski event we did last winter. Also launching a startup business to sort of spin out of the university called Revision Autonomy LLC. That's focused on autonomous vehicle perception for snow-covered roads. I know I, I wanted to give you a little preview of the weather things in here. Um, so we'll talk about that in detail later. Um, piloted two autonomous vehicle, autonomous shuttles on campus. Um, and created two new three credit courses, autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. Um, briefly, this is kind of what the lab looks like. We've got about 3,000 square feet of space that's got desks as well as cars and equipment and stuff like that. Um, we have three autonomous vehicle development platforms. Those two are the main ones, a 2019 Kia Niro Hybrid, a 2015 Kia Soul Electric. Um, the other one is this Arigo Autopod, which is a low-speed shuttle that was just donated. We also have a chassis dyno, lift tools, camera drones, stuff like that. All right, so that's kind of the background for conducting this research. So now I'm going to get into the research itself, starting with projects that are now complete. And these are sometimes the most insightful ones because we know what the, what the findings are. Other projects are still in development, right, and there's not many conclusions to share. Um, but at least for these, and especially my PhD research, we have some well-understood conclusions that I can share. So this is just a, an overview of what that research is. So in my PhD, I focused on hydroelectric vehicle fuel economy improvements. And I call it realized through self-driving technology. But again, I didn't do very much with self-driving technology. Um, essentially, there's this systems level diagram. At the first subsystem computes the worldview around the car, so detecting vehicles in the lane lines. Second subsystem uh, uses that information to design an optimal control problem where you're minimizing the fuel cost or the mass of fuel. And then the third subsystem is executing that control strategy on the vehicle itself and recording or measuring these fuel economy improvements, which are from an actual study. All right, so I'm just going to jump right to the conclusions here. I mean, first of all, we found that there's three important research gaps prohibiting this technology from being implemented in the real world. Um, that's always the finding of, in a literature review, right? So you know, if that's interesting, um, I would encourage you to check out this link on the bottom. All of these publications are available for free on my website. Um, the, the, the real researchy conclusions are the next three bullets here. The first one, optimal control with dynamic programming is robust to mispredictions. This was kind of unknown at the time, at least for this uh, concept. And so basically what we did is we subjected the vehicle to a bunch of real world mispredictions or disturbances if you're a controls person, um, such as uh, the traffic light changing unexpectedly and stuff like that. And we found that the control strategy was pretty robust to that actually. Second thing is we found that optimal control with dynamic programming can currently be used in modern vehicles. Um, this was a little bit surprising. A lot of the research sort of writes off dynamic programming as implementable. So in these two papers, we showed that. And then this is a patent shared with Toyota on how to implement that. And lastly, we found that prediction is a required component in this, and you shouldn't shy away from it. And when it comes to prediction, sensing and artificial intelligence is really the cutting edge, right? So shouldn't shy away from using those things um, in an implementation. All right, so after I finished my PhD, we wrote a proposal, submitted it to the De Department of Energy, um, and it basically was just to continue that work. So here we're looking at the perception and artificial intelligence aspects um, in more detail. This was a collaborative project with Colorado State as the lead, myself at Western Michigan as the co-PI. Also, the National Renewable Energy Lab, City of Fort Collins in Denver, and Northern Colorado Clean Cities Coalition. And so here we're digging into the details of using bigger data sets, specifically including traffic light status, using fancier artificial intelligence, cutting edge deep learning, and looking at the impact of traffic and optimized traffic flow and evaluating citywide benefits. So again, just taking that initial research and expanding it to a higher, uh, a bigger system. And so I want to spend a little bit of time 
discussing some of the different ways to use control of the vehicle to improve the energy efficiency. So there's three ways you can do it. The first one is to change your driving behavior in the vehicle itself, right? So if you're driving from here to, um, you know, Vision Quest Brewery or something, it's like right down the street, but if you were to race out of here, like a bat out of hell, like, oh man, I really need a beer, you know, then you're gonna have terrible fuel economy. Whereas if you're like, it's fine, I'll, I'll find a table, no worries, you're driving really slow, you're gonna get much better fuel economy. So in that instance, you have applied eco-driving, you've, you've driven in, a, in an environmentally friendly way. The other option is eco-routing. So obviously, if you get on the interstate somehow to go somewhere that's only a mile away, you've kind of taken a terrible route. A, a better route is to go directly there. So that's another way to improve fuel economy. And the third one is to optimize how energy is getting from the power source to the wheels. And this is really most effective for hybrid vehicles because there's basically two ways to do that. You can either get electric energy from the battery or mechanical energy from the engine. And when you want to use those depends on what state the vehicle's in. Is it going fast? Is it going slow? Is it slowing down, et cetera? Um, this does work for conventional vehicles and electric vehicles, but it doesn't provide that big of an improvement. All right, so the energy management strategy is really the focus of this project, but I'm gonna loop back to eco-driving more towards the end of this presentation. Okay, so here's, here's the systems level diagram uh, for this project, same one that you saw before, just a little bit cleaner. And for this project, we're also adding optimal traffic management. Um, the traffic management is the classic technique to improve travel time. And then optimal energy management is improving the energy efficiency, of course. So in this study, in the perception subsystem, we have this set of vehicle signals. Um, of course, the vehicle status itself, such as speed, GPS, uh, location, and stuff like that, as well as the historical values of that, and not just 10 seconds in the past, but the last 10 times you drove this route, for example. Also, we have the lead vehicle track from the Advanced Driver's Assistance System, or ADOS. And that's where you just know the status of the vehicle in front of you. That was that image I showed before where you're perceiving the car. And here we also are also adding traffic light information and segment speed. Planning and controls, I mean, this is basically the same. You're just minimizing the fuel cost. Um, the only difference here is that we've added a model predictive control to make it more general. Uh, the vehicle plant that we used is a a validated model of a Toyota Prius, and this is a model that exists in a software called Autonomy developed by Argonne National Lab. So validated against the real world. In this study, this is the drive cycle we use. This is sort of a, a square around Colorado State University's campus, but these are sort of main roads in Fort Collins. You can see the drive cycle or uh, velocity versus time here at the bottom. Um, this is sort of a, a very clean but standard you know, driving pattern. For this project, we had to make a traffic simulation. So this is that same route uh, moved into a software called Sumo. And the optimized traffic is dynamic phase selection and queue length dissipation. And here's the results, right? So looking at just optimized traffic, we get a 20% improvement in travel time. But we also get this fuel economy improvement for free. And that basically is from eco-driving, that's from it just so happens that you know, if the traffic light wasn't red and we didn't have to slow down and then speed up again, we get some kind of fuel economy improvement from that. Whereas when we apply optimal energy management, if you recall, that's the, that's the case where you're not changing the driving behavior, you're just optimizing battery versus engine. Right? So we don't get an improvement in travel time, but we get a nice improvement in fuel economy. But then when you combine them, you get a synergistic improvement in fuel economy. It's bigger than either of them by themselves. And at the same time, you're getting this travel time improvement. And so this is huge for an individual vehicle's case, but also we wanted to apply this to the whole city. And so we use this metric developed by National Renewable Energy Lab called MEP, Mobility Energy Productivity. And they're basically evaluating the mobility energy productivity of the whole city of Fort Collins. And we're applying this to only the route, which you can see as that black square. And you can see, of course, the the blocks get more green, you know, whatever. Um, but what this means is that um, overall, for the whole city of Fort Collins, there is a benefit in just applying this technique to one set of roads in Fort Collins. It benefits the whole city. 
It's not a huge benefit, 1.5% improvement, but it is there. And so, you know, one thing that this suggests is that, um, you know, focusing on, on small sections of a city and implementing technology can make a difference. You don't have to apply new technology to the entire city. All right, so here's um, the main conclusions from this. The number one is optimal energy management and traffic management has synergistic benefits, which was not known before this. A model predictive control with dynamic programming is implementable in the real world. Um, and then in terms of exploring artificial intelligence, we found that this long short-term memory LSTM deep neural network provided the highest accuracy, not only for velocity prediction, but also in predicting the emissions from a hybrid electric vehicle, which is notoriously hard to do. Um, so we had a lot of luck. That was just one of our findings. One of the key findings, though, which was surprising to all of us, is that infrastructure data, and specifically traffic lights, was the most critical for prediction and control implementation. And so this is a, this is a finding that we wanted to apply to future research. All right, so that was that Department of Energy project, and now I'll we'll talk about two autonomous vehicle pilots. This first one used two Arigo Autopods, which is a low-speed shuttle. Um, it was a, this big team here, Pratt Miller Engineering, was the lead, and robotic research and all these other folks. Um, basically, this autopod, the wheelbase, was lengthened to accommodate wheelchair users, and this would pick them up at the bus stop and drive them directly to the front doors of the building where their classroom is autonomously. And so it was a, it was a fun project. Um, I think in terms of my lab, we got a lot of experience in pilot design for a university campus, design for accessibility of wheelchair users, and collecting ridership survey data. So I don't want to go into any of those studies um, in detail. So I'm going to go on to the next uh, autonomous vehicle pilot. In this one, we had four autonomous and teleoperational, which just means remote control, uh, Kia Niro's developed for a Detroit pilot. So you can see each of the Kia Niro's, the fourth one, of course, is from Western. Um, but this was led by FEV North America, which is a German tier one supplier. And the, the concept here was you would pick up media journalists from the Detroit airport in remote control mode drive the car onto the interstate. Once it's on the interstate, it would switch to autonomous mode. And then once it's ready to get off the interstate, it'll switch back to remote control mode and drop that journalist off at their hotel in downtown Detroit. And so this was a, an exciting project because we got experience with autonomous vehicle instrumentation, autonomous system design with the tier one supplier and implementation of teleoperations. But sadly, this pilot never saw the light of day because COVID hit like two months or something before we were ready to kick it off. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that went into this uh, briefly because um, this type of perception is important for the inclement weather stuff later. So here's an example of our Kia Nero driving behind the Kia Soul. And we need to fuse camera and radar data. All right, so the camera data is given to us from a Mobileye product. So Mobileye is this product that can identify the lane lines and the vehicle location um, using computer vision techniques. So you buy it, it does that out of the box. And then the radar gives us detections as well. And so you'll, the problem is that are the de detections it's giving you reliable and, and how do you fuse these, et cetera. So you might have something, when you look at the data, you might have something like this conceptual diagram here on the right where you've got a detected vehicle in the left lane, and we could see in the real world there's not a vehicle there. So that would be a ghost detection. It happens all the time. Um, we have a correct detection of the vehicle in front of us, and then maybe we are detecting a shrub or something off on the side, and we don't really care about that, so somehow we want to ignore that. Um, here's how we designed this experiment. We chose a drive cycle on the interstate in Kalamazoo, and we collected radar data. And it's a scan, electronically scanning radar. So it sort of scans in a mid-range um, on the bottom and then scans in long range, which you can see is that upside down triangle at the top. And so it seems so simple, right? But what happens is we end up with 47,000 detections in just this one scenario from the radar. And it's like, OK, well, how, how in the world are we going to use that? Um, so basically, we just developed uh, a series of filters and transforms and used existing filters and transforms as much as we can 
to kind of pare this down, but you have to use you know, logic every step of the way. So the first thing is to create a dynamic region of interest, which is basically those detected lane lines from Mobileye, but extended a little bit beyond that because vehicles can come in and out of the lane and stuff like that. And so if you apply an initial set of those filters, you may get four detections look, that look like these uh, dots here. And then the question is, well, which one is the right one? Which one is real? And so the, you know, researching um, some of the literature and stuff like that, people have had a lot of success with DB scan and common filters. Um, so suffice it to say, with a lot of trial and error, we're able to uh, pick out which of the points is the detection of the vehicle in front of us. You can see that you know, the radar is giving a couple of different detections that aren't necessarily aligned, and the mobile eye is giving a different set of detections. And we're finally able to fuse those together, uh, shown in the image to the right. And so you know, there's a couple of, of conclusions that we can make from both of these pilots. One is, you know, kind of from both of them, is that autonomous electric shuttles have a viable use case that's economically feasible. And so we've written about that in those two publications. An interesting conclusion is that university campus non-users are highly tolerant of sharing space with an autonomous shuttle, actually. So we, we surveyed the crap out of everyone who did not ride in the shuttles, and we got some pretty surprising results. Um, so we're hoping that those results get published soon. Um, and then the sensor fusion is, you know, it's, it takes time, but it's nothing that, you know, is, is too hard, really. Um, it just requires these purpose-built algorithms. Focus on what you're trying to do, design a framework that makes sense intuitively, and implement it. Um, just be careful because uh, certain algorithms can really run up the computational cost. Uh, the fourth one, autonomous vehicle instrumentation equipment can drastically affect energy use and cost. At the time of this project, it was 250000 to create an autonomous vehicle development platform. And we made ours for 100000 and it does the same stuff. So we, we're hoping that this paper gets published soon so other people can see how to do that. Um, but then also we talk a little bit about how LiDAR and camera choices can affect the overall end uh, sensor um, energy use. Lastly, we found that autonomous vehicle operation in inclement weather is not currently feasible for pilot programs at all. Right? So in these projects, we were not the lead. We were kind of learning from other people. And we were told by everyone involved, do not operate these in any sort of inclement weather. As soon as it, as soon as it was drizzling, shut down operations. Pilot's done for the day. Um, so we were kind of shocked by this. Last project that's already been completed that I want to touch on quickly is just in motion wireless power transfer. If you haven't heard of this, it's basically just charging while driving. Imagine you're an electric vehicle, a charge is about to run out. So you just shift over to this recharging lane and it charges your vehicle for you. So you don't have to stop, um, et cetera. So this is, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the technology. Um, it, it's been shown to drastically uh, reduce battery size, of course, because you don't have to worry about charging so much if you can just charge while you're driving. Addresses the range anxiety issue, allows for semi-truck electrification. I think we would run out of all rare earth metals in the world trying to build the batteries required to electrify every semi-truck. So this is a solution for that. Um, Utah State, as far as I know, is, is leading the world in, in research for this. So if you think this is interesting, I would encourage you to check out their uh, NSF Research Center using that link. Um, I've been involved in some studies in this, and it was more of a, a system rollout um, economic analysis type of stuff. And the main conclusion there was that coordinated infrastructure rollout like this, I mean, this is a million dollars a mile to do this, but it does make economic sense. It has a big upfront cost, but the return on investment is, is low, lower than one might think, and so that's in, some of these papers if you're interested in that. All right, so then that leads me to current projects. So right now we're working on a new Department of Energy project, and we're working on a new National Science Foundation project, and then we're focused on eco-driving as well. So in this new Department of Energy project, we're tasked with designing an autonomous vehicle system that's more energy efficient than current autonomous vehicle systems. 
And we hypothesize that this can be accomplished by relying on infrastructure. But it's not, that's, it's not necessarily fair to say, OK, I'm going to develop an energy efficient autonomous vehicle. I'm going to cut sensors, right? Because I can say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove the radar. I'm going to remove the LIDAR. And now I've just got a camera. And sure, if I'm smart enough, I can make this operate autonomously. Boom, I did it. Um, and that's not really fair because it's not, it might operate autonomously, but not as well. So the very first thing we need to do if we're going to approach this problem is design a metric or use a metric that allows us to compare the operational performance of different autonomous vehicles. Because you can't use number of accidents. <laughs> um, so we looked at this concept of resilience engineering. It turns out resilience is not just a word you can throw around, like this engineering system's resilient, whatever. You can actually scientifically measure resilience. Um, it's an established systems engineering uh, subfield for safety management of complex socio-technical systems and requires assessment of four components, ability of the system to respond, learn, anticipate, and monitor its surroundings. And um, one of the ways that you can measure the, resi the resilience is with this resilience triangle. I think this is, this is where we spend most of our efforts so far. And again, keep in mind that this is supposed to be applied to a general system. Um, people are focused on using this for like the electric grid and stuff like that. Um, but so you've got some nominal condition for the functionality of your system. And inevitably, there's some disturbance or deviation that throws you off of that nominal condition. So then the question is, how fast can you get back to that nominal condition? If you can do it quickly, it's high resilience. If you can still do it, but it takes a while, it's low resilience. And if you can never do it, then it's zero resilience. You have no resilience at all. So I think this is kind of an initial way to, to get started understanding how resilience is measured. The problem with this is that no one has applied it to autonomous vehicles. Um, so we had to do that. We created a proof of concept test case in the Carla simulation software where the vehicle was asked to drive this route with a couple of turns in it. And we asked the vehicle to, well, we required, forced the vehicle to drive it at a couple of different speeds. And what we find is that using these resilience engineering metrics, driving at, you know, it's the sort of the results match our intuition, which is better than what happens when you use current metrics. So for example, driving at low speed, you could argue has, has a, a good resilience because you've sort of eliminated or reduced as much as possible cross-track error and control effort. And I know those are, those are big numbers, but bigger is better. Um, it's just kind of the way that the math uh, lays out. Um, but then we found that recovery is improved if you're going slightly faster. Okay, So if you're going a little bit faster and, you're, and you deviate from the track, then you can get back onto that route faster. And that's actually a better resilience, which makes sense. You don't want to drive in the shoulder for any longer than you have to. And these are things that current metrics don't tell you. Um, so it at least matches resilience in terms of how the vehicle should operate. And we are comfortable moving forward applying these so that different autonomous systems can be compared apples to apples. All right, so here's the new autonomous system that we're trying to develop. Um, we're working on five infrastructure sensors, and I can get into these in more detail at the end if people have questions. But um, basically, working on a chip-enabled raised pavement marker. So raised pavement markers exist right now. Um, departments of Transportation install, maintain, and remove them regularly. And so if we replaced them with a version that had a chip in it, you could transmit where the lane lines are directly to the car. You don't need to perceive those and waste computational resources. Um, it's kind of the same story with the radar retro reflector. We're just looking for ways to get the radar of the vehicle more involved. Um, and then also, we are looking at offloading some of the computational costs through the cellular network. So imagine if you have a fleet of 100 autonomous vehicles that are all crunching through data and, and burning gas or something while that's happening, well, imagine if instead of that, you offload all of that computational cost to a facility that's at a waterfall or something. So it's getting all this energy for free. And then you crunch the numbers there, send it back to the vehicle. Um, so that's something that we're looking at. And then also looking at including high definition maps as well as weather sensors. So of course, we're funded to do this work for the Department of Energy because these sensors have a potential to improve energy efficiency. 
But I personally also hypothesize that these sensors will be very beneficial for driving in the heavy snowfall condition. Um, infrastructure sensors would allow you, for example, to overlay the road on top of a heavy snow case so you can see where the road is and make sure that you're not driving off the edge of it. Um, you know, here's the year one project schedule for this. Uh, we've got, we're also working with Oak Ridge National Lab, DriveU and NCAR, of course, um, helping us with the weather sensors. We know nothing about weather and very happy that NCAR is, is on the team. Um, also on this project, we've got a couple of different stakeholders, Michigan and Tennessee Departments of Transportation, as well as some metropolitan transportation authorities and cities that are interested in how this technology is working. Is it feasible? Should they start to think about you know, a couple of different tests of this infrastructure? All right, so that's pretty much everything about the new DOE project that we've done so far. Um, I want to transition to this other project, this new uh, National Science Foundation Partnerships for Innovation project. And the work on this has started a long, like several years ago. Um, it, this is not just, oh, I had an idea, I wrote a proposal. Um, it really kind of started in 2018 when we were working on, on these pilots and realizing that they couldn't work in inclement weather. And coincidentally, Bill Mahoney was giving a talk at the American Center for Mobility and he basically, you know, his thesis was the number one problem for autonomous vehicles is weather. And so my PhD student was at that talk. I mean, he, we were looking for a project for him at the time, and we basically looked at each other and we said, oh, I think that's your project. <laughs> so it was kind of a concept initially. Um, I started writing proposals right away, and so we got some sort of technology development funding as well as some commercialization funding. So we wanted to create this startup business to get the products out there and start making a difference as soon as possible, rather than just shaking research papers at people in industry and saying, do this, do this. We're just going to do it ourselves. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the NSF project. And I know that um, everyone's interested in inclement weather, so I'll talk about this in more detail. Um, starting with the problem statement, uh, motor vehicle crashes are a top cause of non-natural death behind only drug overdose and suicide. 39,000 people in the US die annually um, and motor vehicle crashes in the world, it's like three million or over three million. And inclement weather is a major part of this problem that does not get enough attention. So for example, if we take that, that set of data and divide it into US highways only, and then look at the number of crashes on US highway that are a direct cause of inclement weather, that's 21% on the US highway. So that's 50, over 5,300 of those fatalities, um, over 418,000 injuries and billions of dollars lost due to emergency services, inc insurance claims, damages, time delays, et cetera. Um, so these are, of course, numbers from an NCAR paper. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for that. Um, so here's, here's what the research and commercialization is about. Um, on the top, you see how uh, current advanced driver's assistance system products reduce crashes. First, you have a camera image that has clear lane lines shown. You identify those lane lines using artificial intelligence, convolutional neural networks. The output is the lane line location. So that image is from our mobilized sensor in Arvis. And once you know where those lane lines are, then you can determine if the vehicle is outside those lane lines and if it is, steer it back in. All right, so these are you know, lane centering, lane departure warning, lane keeping assistance systems. And these are well known for reducing crashes. Um, they're really critical, but they are designed to shut down in any instance of inclement weather. Um, so we are hoping to fix that. Um, our product is basically doing the same thing, but not necessarily always just looking for lane lines. So in this example, if we've got some clearly visible tire tracks, we can use that information instead. Um, the number one comment I get when I say this is, oh yeah, you're gonna follow the tire tracks right off a cliff. And I'm just like, give me a second to explain here. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> like, if you're driving your own car, like sometimes I follow tire tracks in the snow. I don't drive off a cliff, right? So. There's, there's another part of this that checks for cliffs, right? So we're not driving on cliffs. Um, so you, you kind of compare this information to where you expect the road to be. If it doesn't align, there's a problem. 
Um, you can communicate map data as well and make sure that you're not near a cliff, stuff like that. Um, but the point is, is that um, you can reliably detect these tire tracks, and I'll actually go into a lot of detail for how that's done. Um, but this is the systems level diagram for these products. You can see existing products at the top. Use a camera image, check that there's no snow. OK, no snow, great. Here's the lane lines. Pass that to the planning subsystem. Where in this case, if there is inclement weather, what you want to do is just collect as much data as you can, and then first figure out how much snow is on the road. Um, if there's no snow, then give it to the existing product. If there's a little bit of snow, then maybe you can still look for lane lines and supplement that with another algorithm. Um, if there's heavy snow, then maybe you need to rely on some infrastructure data. And so depending on the answer to the snow coverage amount, you might use a different suite of algorithms to find that drivable region. And so the output here is um, the lane line location equivalent, which is then also passed to the planning subsystem. And so the point is that you can develop technology that addresses the inclement weather problem, but it's more complicated and you just have to focus on building it up from the fundamentals and designing purpose-built technology. All right, so I wanted to cover um, some of the details for how you build a tire track detection algorithm because this research is published. Um, so, you know, you can go and find more details for stuff that I don't have time to cover. But this is basically the model development pipeline. Um, this is stuff, there are no existing data sets for this. So the number one thing is you have to go out and collect your own data first. Uh, once you have your own data, then you can complete this data preparation pipeline. So you have a video file that you want to look at image by image. And so we use this annotation software called CVAT, free and open source. And you have to manually label where the tire tracks are. And it doesn't change too much in between images, so you can do it for every like 10 images or something like that. But you need this manual annotation for where the tire tracks are so that you can evaluate your algorithm and, and train your algorithm and stuff like that. Um, so then the next thing is feature extraction. So from those images, you want to explore a couple of different features that might be important for the problem. So the first thing, of course, is to develop a region of interest mask. Um, the road's not going to be in the sky. It's not going to be in, you know, up near the moon or something. So you can ignore that section of the image. So you create this mask. Um, and then you want to basically only be looking at the mask. And so within that mask are the pixel values you know, what are the pixel values for the red, green, or blue channel? Maybe we only care about the gray channel. Maybe we care about the pixel locations, et cetera. And so he developed this, these four feature sets, looking at just uh, gray pixel values, X and Y locations, et cetera. So then once you have that, then you can train the machine learning model. And, you know, machine learning training is, is pretty standard at this point. There's a lot of software that makes this fairly easy. Suffice it to say, you have this set of data, and you want to divide it into a, you know, maybe 60%, 70%, and use that to train your artificial neural network. What that means is that you're just setting the weights and biases for that neuron model, and um, those are just numbers. Um, it's, it's actually not, not that complicated. And so once the weight and bias numbers are assigned, then you want to take another subset of that data and evaluate how it's performing. If it's performing well, great, move on. If it's not, then go back and think of a different training method or tweak some of the architecture of the neural network, et cetera. All right, so then when it comes to evaluating your final model, there's a set of standard metrics, accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score. Um, but in our case, we really care about intersection over union. So imagine we've got some predicted tire track in yellow and our actual tire track in blue. We want those to be as aligned as possible. And so for this application, we argue that mean intersection over union is the best metric. So again, here's the overview of that total model development pipeline. And then looking at these results, we can compare some of the different mean intersection over union. So here we see that this random forest with feature set one has the highest mean intersection over union, so perhaps only the gray pixel values and pixel locations matter. Next, we can look at frames per second. 
right? So if we look at this random forest with feature set one and compare it to this decision trees feature with feature set one, we can see that there's only a slight, slight drop in mean intersection over union, but a hundredfold increase in frames per second of the algorithm performance, right? So it's important to consider runtime implications. And so here we would argue that it's worth um, using a decision trees model because it gives you that, you know, large increase in frames per second. So at the end of the day, um, for this work that I've covered here, if you were to implement it, you might get stats that look something like this. Uh, processing speed of about 35 frames per second, look ahead distance of 95 feet, which is kind of a bare minimum for products, but this is, you know, this is just one study starting from absolute scratch. Um, 100 feet look ahead distance um, is, is not that much. It gives you about two seconds of warning. And then this was also developed for two-lane arterial roads in Kalamazoo. Um, we have done a lot of uh, improving this since that paper was published. Um, we're, we're enjoying the use of a UNet convolutional neural network right now because it saves time labeling the images. Um, and then we're also working with our collaborators in Eaton. They have a proving grounds that's close to our lab um, and they're happy to let us do some tests out there for free. All right, so all of this is to kind of build up to this NSF PFI project. Um, what we found from talking to people in industry is that we need to improve our key performance indicators, right? People in industry don't care about a technology unless you can show that it works for over a thousand miles. So that's technical barrier number one that we need to overcome in the first year, is at least collect data for a thousand miles so that we can start to crunch numbers and show that it's giving reliable detections. Um, over that distance. Of course, you know, we technical barrier two, module improvements, we want to make the algorithms more robust. There's things that we're going to have to do to make them work on that thousand miles. There's going to be, you know, sticks in the road and stuff like that that we haven't seen before, and that's just part of the process. In year two, we're working on technical barrier three, which is vehicle integration. Um, we want to demonstrate functionality on our 2019 Kia Niro. We have this working already but it's more about just making a, a nice, slick-looking demo at the Eaton Proving Grounds and stuff like that. Because again, we're trying to commercialize this technology and we need to convince people in industry that this is exciting and this is doable. And then the third technical barrier, or the third, in year three, we're looking at technical barrier four, which is embedded hardware. So instead of just taking my laptop, plugging it into the car and running it, we need to actually focus on embedded hardware small computer chips that could exist on production cars today. Um, here's the project schedule for that project. Um, it really kind of revolves around the winter season, prep for winter, working really hard over winter, collecting data, and then seeing what went right, what went wrong after winter's over. All right, so then just really quickly, just in one slide here, um, the third thing that we're focused on right now is autonomous eco-driving for energy efficiency. So that previous work I talked about was optimal energy management for hybrid electric vehicles. But with the internal combustion engine being sunsetted, there's a, co I mean, there's a coalition of um, automotive companies in Michigan that have sort of said that it's gonna have two, two more generations then they're done with internal combustion engines. So for us, it doesn't make sense. If the industry's dropping this, it certainly doesn't make sense for the university to continue researching this. So we're kind of, not focused on hybrid electric vehicles anymore. We were focused on fully electric vehicles instead. And as I mentioned, optimal energy management doesn't work that well for electric vehicles. Um, so we're switching over to eco-driving. Eco-driving works great in, in autonomous vehicles, definitely recommend it. Um, so here's just a, a brief study that we've done. Um, this is for an arterial and downtown route in Kalamazoo. You can see the dashed blue and red lines um, represent the upper and lower bound constraints for where the vehicle can drive. And this is basically from traffic lights and vehicles and, and speed limits and stuff like that. And everything in between is, is free real estate, right? It's, you know, the car can drive and, and speed up and slow down and whatever it wants. And so we run an optimization algorithm through this. Um, the one we did was best inter constrained interpolation in a strip. And we find um, that optimal drive cycle. And so here in the table, you can see some of the results for a conventional hybrid and electric vehicle. 
And for example, I, I'll, you know, I'll just cover the electric one, uh, 2016 Tesla Model S. This is a model in FastSim. The EPA reports the miles per gallon equivalent for this vehicle of 98. But for the arterial route, we recorded 220 and the downtown route, 243. So this works really well for electric vehicles and we are um, hoping to pursue some new funded projects in this. But again, you know, kind of a key enabler for this is infrastructure technology. If we don't have that traffic light information, we can't build the upper bound constraint. And so again, we're finding in, in all these different areas of research that infrastructure is key. All right, so just briefly, I'm gonna to touch on future work. Um, I can envision doing, you know, two more pilots. Um, the first one could use this uh, autopod that was donated to the lab. Um, we could transport students to and from different buildings on campus, but in snow. And then we can work with Kalamazoo Metro. They've got two 40-foot buses that drive from Western's main campus to engineering campus Monday through Friday. So we could incorporate some of our technologies so those buses can drive safer in snow. And I think that this is important because I'm not aware of any other campus pilot that has previously addressed inclement weather. And so I think this would be really important to get some eyes on this, on this space and showing people that this is possible. Um, and then, you know, I think something that's gonna take up a lot of my time in the future is, is this commercialization project. So we're working on an SBIR, a small business proposal to address inclement weather corner cases. So not only overcoming those technical barriers on the NSF uh, project that's now funded, but this would be funding directly for the business so that I, we can employ engineers at the business to focus on some of these things that people in industry have told us are important like driving through complicated intersections that are hard to interpret, dealing with active snowfall, um, dealing with instances of misleading environmental information and stuff like that. Um, I, lastly, I just wanna kind of point out why, at least in my opinion, I think it's a good idea to have a business that's connected to a university. I think it gives you a lot of protection from competition because you have not, well, there's several reasons. Uh, number one is you have this experience with foundational research to develop new things from scratch. Um, you have a pipeline to employees from the university. I'm trying to develop some new certificate programs that would make that even faster. Um, and then there's relationships that the university can foster between government and, and helping to create some of this infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, you ought to be in a region that has snow, right? But anyway, I think that this relationship with the university is, is important for companies. Um, so, you know, this is just a kind of a quick reminder of everything that I covered here. Um, and, I, and again, I think a big focus in the future is going to be on this commercialization. As I mentioned, a lot of people are dying in inclement weather and they want to do something about it. Um, so if you don't take anything else away from this presentation, I want you to remember just these two things. Okay, number one, and, and this is just in my experience so far, so keep that in mind, but number one is that infrastructure is key for sustainable and safe automotive transportation. We've seen this again and again on many different studies. And number two is that inclement weather can be addressed. It's not impossible, but it's, it's hard work, right? So you, we should be tackling it and we should be going after um, solutions here. And it's something that can be tackled with purpose-built technology. Developing things from the ground up, it will work. Um, and yeah, that's sort of my, my main finding. So again, you know, I'm Zach Asher. If I'd be happy to take any questions. If you think of a question even after this ends, feel free to shoot me an email. As I mentioned, all my publications are available for free on my website. So thanks so much for inviting me. Um, happy to take questions. And thank you so much, Zach. Um, for the folks online, I certainly wanted to remind you, um, feel free to use the Slido to post questions, and we're happy to, um, to read those here in the room. Um, are there any, I'll start off with folks in the room. Are there any questions in the room? 
Hi, Zach. Thanks for um, joining us and really enjoyed the seminar. Um, first of all, the infrastructure is key. And you mentioned traffic lights, and you started to imply on what could be there. What is your vision for how roadways would eventually be instrumented to allow the autonomous vehicle technology to really flourish? I, OK, thank you. Um, I saw you taking a lot of notes during the presentation, and I was, I'm was, i kind of like, oh, boy, this is going to be a good question. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really important thing to think about. Number one is that this traffic light information. I mean, obviously, I've spent a lot of time thinking about energy efficiency, and climate change is super important. And I think there's big impacts that can happen if we can transmit traffic light information to vehicles and not rely on drivers to interpret the traffic light and then react accordingly. We have evidence that shows that if, if not only the traffic light that you're at, but the one after that one, if that one's green also, there's things that you can do. Or maybe that one's going to turn red, so you don't need to speed up as much. It has a huge impact. Um, so I think number one, you know, uh, just for, for a concept example, like imagine just having some sort of receiver box on your car that's just getting traffic light information. If we could do that, um, there's things that automotive companies could do um, to, make that, to make that work for energy efficiency. So that seems like the easiest thing that we could do. Um, to, to get at the other part of your question, um, you know, what kind of infrastructure for autonomous vehicles? I mean, I would kind of... The way that I think about it and the way that I try to challenge my students to think about it is, you know, these are not humans. <laughs> this is a robot, right? So as humans, we look for visual cues. And, and the roads are all designed for visual cues. They're designed for humans. But how do computers think, you know? Or how do computers perceive the world? What do they like? Well, um, it turns out that they can operate a bit better with radar, for example. They don't need to see stuff with a camera. We, as, we, we like to see stuff, and so we tend to want to use cameras. But radar works a bit better. Radar works in inclement weather. It's been around for a long time. It's a very mature technology. And so that's one of the things we're looking at with the Department of Energy project is, you know, for example, you can't, you can't see the lane lines with radar. But what if you could? Um, if we had some sort of radar retro reflector on the road, then maybe the radar on a vehicle can operate a lot more safely. I mean, we don't need all this, all this camera stuff, and, and the radar is, is going to handle rain and everything much better. Um, so I think, you know, to, try, to answer your question in a very broad sense, I think what we need is stuff that's friendly to computers and robots and not necessarily friendly to humans. We can have both, for sure. It's going to take a long time before every vehicle is autonomous. But we need to start thinking about it as what is beneficial for a computer. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So instrumenting the roads themselves. Yes, yes. And it's kind of like the in-motion wireless power transfer, right? If you're the charging the vehicle is on the road itself. So similar. Thanks, Zach. Um, we have two questions online. I want to get to those. Great. The first from Jared Lee. Um, nice talk. In addition to developing these algorithms to handle driving and in inclement weather, how will your algorithms account for disabled or emergency vehicles, or pedestrians or cyclists for that matter, just outside the lane line? for which the car really should slow down. Yeah, I will confess that pedestrians and cyclists is something that we haven't thought a lot about. Um, and so there's researchers in this space that think only about pedestrians and cyclists. And I, I have a collaborator at Western who does a lot of the sensor fusion stuff. And I, he thinks a lot more about pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so. Of course, you don't want to hit a pedestrian or cyclist or cause them any sort of Ill, Ill will or anything like that. Um, and I mean, I think there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, one of the most exciting ways that I've seen is with the cellular V2X technology, where basically they have their own type of transmitter. And so you could just put it in your pocket, and then any autonomous vehicle will automatically know where you are. 
Um, you don't have to rely on a camera performing perfectly. If there's a little smudge on it, it's not going to see you and stuff like that. It's transmitted directly to the vehicle. And you know, people have talked about, OK, well, I'll turn that into an app. And so anyone with a smartphone will essentially be communicating to the autonomous vehicle. And so you know, again, I'll say that I don't know. I you know, haven't thought too, too in depth on how that might work. But certainly an, an out-of-the-box approach that's more of like a direct communication type of thing is something that I would be in favor of. Thank you. And the second question online comes from oh, oh, actually, actually, before we go to the second question, he did ask about emergency vehicles and stuff like that, too, which I did not respond to. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that, too. Um, so, you know, again, like I've, I've been thinking more about um, like road construction and stuff like that. Um, so it's I'm going to kind of answer it in the context of road construction. Um, so basically, we have this problem. If you're relying on high definition maps exclusively, I can go out and I can map um, the interstate from here to North Carolina or something like that. And you know, it'll take me six months or whatever, but I arrive in North Carolina and I you know, sit on the beach and, and enjoy a job well done. Well, meanwhile, it's summertime in Colorado again and some road construction starts. So now I got to go back and redo the whole thing. And I'm just going to do that forever until I die. right? Um, and people don't like that, understandably. And so instead, if you have, for example, a raised pavement marker that um, requires a special tool to remove and, and install, and, and all those processes exist. It's managed by departments of transportation, so people can't just pull it out of the road. Um, but if you're starting construction, you would say, OK, I'm going to move this raised pavement marker, and I'm going to move it over here. It's the, it's the equivalent of putting up road cones. Right, so I'm going to move it over here, and now any vehicle that's relying on that now automatically knows, OK, I'm going to drive over here now. Um, so in terms of how that works with emergency vehicles, I mean, I think there's things you could do but with you know, giving priority and stuff like that. Um, but you, know, you, could, you could have special sensors for just emergency vehicles. Um, just a quick follow-up to that. Would it essentially be like a digital road flare? Or an electronic road flare. Yeah, concept. exactly. That's a great. Yeah, that's a great way to cool. explain it. I like that. Yeah, I'll remember you. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and then for the second online question, for on-road wireless charging infrastructure, to my knowledge, wireless charging is notably less energy efficient than wired charging. What considerations must be taken when weighing the poor power efficiency of wireless charging and the environmental impacts and economic feasibility of more batteries? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it's, that's usually on the, on the front of everyone's mind when it comes to this topic. And ag again, I'll confess that I am certainly not an expert in this field. This Utah State group is primarily composed of electrical engineers, but they're huge. You know, there's like 40 professors that are directly funded under this project. Um, and so, I, I mean, I've kind of seen a lot of their talks. They host their own conference and stuff like that. But, the technology that they're using is 98% efficient compared to plugging in. So there is a small loss, but it's sort of an acceptable loss because you get all these other benefits as well. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm not an expert in this, but you know, there's things you could look at in terms of like power transmission losses. And depending on where these roads are, I mean, what they're trying to do right now is, is roll this out, starting with the, mo the busiest port you know, from San Francisco out um, you know, 50 miles or something to where all these semi-trucks are going. Um, and so there's potentially uh, other ways that you can recoup that 2% of energy that's lost there in terms of looking at you know, where power is available and stuff like that. Um, but you know, also, the industry is, is moving towards wireless charging for their electric vehicles. People can't be bothered to plug in electric vehicles. It's too hard. It's too much work. Um, so people just want to pull into their garage and get out and leave and just have a pad that charges below it. And so, in my experience, um, this 2% this loss is just something that people accept. Because if more people will drive an electric vehicle because their number one problem is they don't want to plug it in, then it's worth it. <laughs> you know. So um, anyway, that would be my answer. Sounds good. Thank you. I know we're at time, so I certainly want to thank, again, um, those of you who have joined our seminar. 
Um, Zach is with us for about another day, so feel free to reach out to me if you are interested in chatting with him, um, whether during his visit or um, once he goes back to WMU. But with that, thanks again for joining the seminar, and please join us um, at future ones as well. Thank you. Thanks.